Uh, to start with, I I'd like to share with you uh, three convictions that we have at AG related to the uh, energy transition and development issues or challenges. First conviction, uh, although it is a common belief that economic development and energy transition cannot go together, this is simply not more true. Why? In fact, uh, when we consider what was used to be said in the past, uh, still, still, still types on economic development versus energy transition often include uh, the following arguments. Some historical reasons, industrialization of Western countries relied heavily on oil and coal. It should be the same in the emerging countries then. Capa second, capacity issues. Renewable energy sources would not be able to fulfill huge energy needs of emerging countries. And third, well, there is a question of priorities. Energy transition is viewed as a nice problem to have versus poverty alleviation. But in fact, all of this was uh, true until new technologies made clean energy sources become financially competitive. And this is something which is now really new and known in the fact that energy transition is no more a, thi a nice thing to think about. It's becoming the best economic option. Energy transition is on the way and nothing will stop it. That's what we think at NG. And even some negative announcement like uh, uh, President Trump's made uh, recently uh, will not be as dramatic as uh, it, it may sound. I will come back to that a bit later. A few examples, for instance, uh, as you may know, we now have uh, bids for uh, solar power in uh, some emerging countries, be it in, uh, uh, the, uh, in, in the Gulf uh, region or in Latin America, which are below 40, even 30 euros per megawatt hour, which is very low. Um, Second point, uh, the reality goes beyond the size of the to-be-discovered oil reservoir. The issue is now clearly linked to the virtuous cycle of technology, innovation and economics. And in this possible future, thanks to this virtual circle, well, oil could become the new coal, meaning we wouldn't need oil anymore in the long term. I'd like just to mention one recent uh, IMF paper, working paper published last month, where indeed uh, we could, well, the, the, the authors consider that uh, based on the current trend and the development of electric vehicles, uh, oil could, which is today the main fuel for transportation, could have a much shorter lifespan left than commonly assumed. And of course, we have this huge development of renewables, uh, which is, by the way, good news, uh, responsible for a massive job boom. And uh, uh, according to the uh, International Renewable Energy Agency, about 10 million people work in renewable energy industry throughout the world. And even in the US, there are roughly five more people working in renewable energies than in the coal industry. Second conviction, the fact that because it is becoming the best economic option, emerging countries are now considering the energy transition as an opportunity to accelerate, to speed up their development. The, uh, uh, as, well, as we usually say uh, at NG, energy transition is driven, is driven by the combination of the famous three Ds, which are the key factors for speeding up the economic growth. First D being decentralization, second decarbonization, and the third one, digitization. As regards decentralization, we see the acceleration of development through decentralized, cheaper sources of energy. And instead of following the history's path, a number of emerging countries will probably directly adopt solo PV and mini grids skipping conventional energy sources stage with, uh, for instance, power lines uh, being deployed in the countries. And we have already a good example in some region like Africa, 
where, uh, as we know, mobile phones uh, are now widely used uh, in African countries with no need for long lines. Uh, second D, digitization, uh, which is at the core of the efficient economic development. Uh, we, we know that uh, energy waste is definitely uh, one of the major issues to, to be tackled. And uh, thanks to digital technologies, we, are, uh, we have now uh, a massive source of economic growth by using less energy than, uh, than previously. And this is typically the case in buildings where, uh, for countries uh, like, like France, for instance, almost 50% of the energy used uh, is used for, for, for buildings. Then we have uh, decarbonization and uh, it used to be uh, considered that uh, the issue of CO2 emissions was uh, an issue for rich countries, but we see that there are more and more uh, challenges to be tackled in emerging countries uh, linked to CO2 emissions, but also for, let's say, uh, poor uh, air quality, which often comes with CO2 emissions, for instance, when uh, coal is burnt uh, to produce power. And um, beyond pure economic growth, energy transition is also a very uh, sensitive political topic because not respecting current climate constraints would lead to a number of disasters, and we know what it is about, it could be floods and so on, possibly leading to political instability, massive population moves, unrest and wars. Um, which would definitely harm the development of emerging countries, uh, which will sit in the front row of those uh, possible um, issues. Another point I'd like to stress, the fact that energy transition also means that giving up oil diplomacy and reshuffle the global world order. And some countries like India, some China, have definitely understood that uh, not depending on oil imports or coal imports, but mainly oil, will give them a new card to play uh, as emerging countries. And we do believe that geopolitics will never look the same thanks to uh, the decrease of oil consumption in emerging countries. And then there is no, no surprise to see that emerging countries have become prominent supporters of renewable energy uh, they, they are now able to use uh, cheap solar power to sustain their huge needs for, for energy without depending on oil and coal. And for instance, some countries like Morocco or Chile, where, where uh, energy operates, uh, in those countries, green techs have been widely recognized as critical factors for energy independence and economic growth. Just one example, uh, you may, may have noticed, for instance, that uh, in India, uh, it is foreseen, it is, uh, let's say, yes, foreseen that all vehicles sold as from 2030 uh, would be electric vehicles. Of course, it will need more power and more solar power to, to be produced, but this is what is expected in India. Solar is definitely getting really competitive. Other green options will soon come to the forefront, uh, boosted by technology, uh, te technological innovations. We have, for instance, offshore wind, which is becoming more and more competitive, uh, especially in Europe, where now uh, some players propose bids which are at market level, meaning that no subsidies are needed to, be, uh, to produce uh, power uh, in f from uh, offshore wind as from the next decade. And of course, we need to get prepared for the next revolution being uh, the storage revolution, the battery revolution for power. So now that um, we, we, we see that uh, this energy transition and that uh, green energy is the best economic option, energy transition is happening, what can be done to facilitate and accelerate it? I, I do believe that my colleagues will uh, come back on that, on that uh, challenge. What we see is that, um, well, beyond emerging countries' specific situation, the issue between energy transition and development is also everyone's issues. And because this is linked to the global 
uh, and the growing uh, global awareness on, uh, on, on uh, warming. And uh, what, what was rather interesting those last days was to consider reactions to Trump's withdrawal from Paris Agreement, where uh, we uh, see many, let's say, institutions, cities, companies, uh, stating a strong support to the Paris Agreement, uh, keeping, uh, having in mind that uh, this global commitment is key for, for everyone. So what can be done to speed up the energy transition in emerging countries and elsewhere? Locally, uh, we need to ensure a stable regulatory framework which effectively drives costs down and attract investors and industries. And here we have a good example at NG in Morocco, uh, where uh, there is an excellent regulation which has made it possible to announce the construction of uh, some wind energy capacity that will deliver power at record low cost of uh, 28 euros per, mega per megawatt hour. There are also some better regulation uh, being uh, put in place in countries like Ivory Coast, uh, in South Africa, and also most recently in, in Zambia. Second uh, point uh, to be addressed, it's about the fiscal schemes, uh, which need to be designed to build the adequate constraints and foster energy transition. And here, of course, the main issue is about carbon price, it's uh, one of the most obvious uh, topics to be, to be addressed uh, so that uh, the right price signals are given to the market to uh, uh, foster the appropriate investments. And there is um, a recent report published last month uh, by the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition uh, which uh, support the idea of a strong carbon price uh, with some steps in prices uh, by the end of uh, this decade and by the end of the next decade up to, let's say, in the range of 50 to $100 per ton of CO2. <clears throat> and uh, in addition uh, to uh, this uh, fiscal scheme and uh, to the local appropriate regulation, we also need some financial stimulus uh, from international network, and, and Stefan, I'm sure you will uh, address this challenge. Uh, we do believe that uh, this international support is needed uh, when uh, local initiatives need to be supported, uh, where uh, there is still a need from an economic perspective uh, to have this stimulus, but as soon as um, technological um, solutions and business models can fly by themselves, uh, there shouldn't be any more uh, stimulus. I've just mentioned some, uh, the, the need for new business models in countries like, like Africa, uh, and this is linked somehow to regulation. The, the many uh, conditions are already here to foster uh, green energy to be deployed in countries like uh, Morocco once again. But what is really at stake is to be able to find the right business models in those countries with the, the right uh, regulatory framework so that everybody can, uh, let's say, uh, find a, a, a way uh, to, to, uh, to deploy the right technologies in, in, in those countries. And last but not least, as regards the, the support from uh, international institutions that, uh, th that we see as, as, uh, as needed, um, I'd like to mention the uh, Terawatt Initiative. Maybe you've heard about it. Uh, Terawatt is an organization that, uni that unites energy providers and financial institutions from all over the world. French companies are... Uh, part of this terawatt initiative like NG uh, and the aim is uh, to um, unlock uh, some, um, let's say, some, some difficulties uh, towards affordable solar power uh, in uh, the 120 member states of the International Solar Alliance. So this is key in our opinion to uh, foster and speed up the, the, the development of solar power all, of, all, over, all around the world. So based on the three, uh, these, those three convictions, um, we are, um, let's say, very optimistic 
at NG that uh, green energy uh, will support economic development in emerging countries, uh, provided that the right schemes, be it local regulation, uh, financial support, uh, fiscal schemes uh, to send the right uh, price signal, are here uh, to support investments. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you for the perfect timing, Antoine, uh, not only for the quality of your presentation, but also for the timing. Thank you. So, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you. I, I will start with two apologies. Uh, first, I apologize that my French is not better. Uh, moi, je parle un très, très peu de français, mais uh, not enough to finish that sentence even. Um, so, we, uh, I will try to understand your questions in French, but probably will need some help translating. I also, I don't know what to say other than I'm sorry for my President Trump. Uh, I will only point out that I'm from California, and the, the governor of California is being very ambitious on climate goals, and after Trump made the announcement withdrawing from Paris, my governor went to China to, to meet with China to talk about climate, climate goals. So there are, there are other factions within the U.S. that are thinking hard about, about climate. So I, I want to take off from where Christian and Anton started, talking about the role of energy in development. And clearly, at a high level, if you look at the relationship between energy, say, kilowatt hours per person, or you know, BTU per person, if you want to include other energy sources, there's a strong relationship between those measures and GDP per capita. So development is clearly correlated with energy consumption. But what I've tried to do in my research is, is drill into that relationship and try to figure out how exactly energy drives development or does development drive energy as people get wealthier, they consume more energy. And one of the things that I really like about uh, energy and electricity in particular is that it really infuses lots of aspects of our lives. So we use it in our homes, we use it at meetings, we use it to power factories, we use it to, to transport goods. And so I think it's important to learn more about that, that basic correlation and try to figure out if we had a dollar to invest in the energy sector, what would be the most profitable investment in terms of driving development? And so one of the things that comes up a lot in discussions about energy and development is the fact that there are 1.1 or 1.3 or 1.2 billion people in the world who don't have energy in their homes. That, that's a, a fact that often gets uh, cited at discussions like this. And there are a lot of programs that are designed to, to bring electricity to the, the, the 1.2 billion people who don't have it. And so what I've done in, as part of my research is to, to really try to understand what happens to people when you bring electricity to them. So we tell ourselves a lot of stories that if you bring electricity to somebody's home, the kids will study longer at night, people will be able to refrigerate food, and therefore they will consume higher quality calories, they'll be healthier, maybe that they'll switch away from kerosene and again be healthier. But I really wanted to try to, to quantify that. And so uh, what some colleagues in, of mine and I have done is, is an experiment. And it's basically the same idea as what pharmaceutical companies do when they're trying to develop a drug or trying to prove that a drug works. They have a control group who's given a sugar tablet, a placebo, and then the treatment group who gets the, the new drug. And so we've done that at uh, a small scale in Western Kenya. So we selected villages randomly. Some of the villages got treatment. In this case, it wasn't, it wasn't a drug, it was the electricity connection. We, we paid for the households in the treated communities to connect to the grid. And then randomly selected another set of communities that were identical in terms of characteristics, they had the same level of income, the same education, same, um, you know, same engagement in the agrarian life there, but they did not get electricity connections, at least not from us. Some of them paid, a, a very small share paid to connect themselves to the grid. 
And what we found has been pretty striking to me. What, what we found was not what we anticipated. We found that bringing people electricity did not have very dramatic impacts on their lives. In fact, statistically, we found essentially zero impacts on people's lives. We found that the, the kids weren't studying more and, and weren't getting better grades, that people's incomes didn't go up, that people uh, weren't consuming different types of foods. So it's really made me think about how much of a role rural electrification should play in the energy transition. And I think there, there are a couple things to think about in, in rural electrification. One is that the people who are, are without electricity in their homes now lack many things. They're, they're you know, almost by definition some of the world's poorest people. So not only do they lack electricity, they lack clean water, they lack good education, they lack, you know, in many cases they, they lack stable food sources. And so it's not clear that bringing these people electricity is, is really the number one way to solve poverty. So I, I, I think it, it's made me think about that, especially looking at the people who we brought electricity who were using, uh, on the average month, they were using 17 kilowatt hours. The typical American uses that much in 18 hours in a day. And so th th these people were just not using very much electricity. In part, they were, they were poor, and so they couldn't buy the appliances they needed to use the electricity. So if you bring people electricity, you're not bringing something they can directly use. They need to spend more money to buy the appliances. The other thing, and, and this gets to Antoine's point about institutions, the reliability of the electricity that we were delivering to them is, is not what we experience in um, the developed world, the, the reliability was very poor. And so in some of the communities that we were looking at, they had outages that lasted not just multiple hours, they lasted multiple months. They had no electricity for, for three months. And so it's not that surprising that the, that the impacts are, are small. And so I guess I, I would like to introduce into your mind some suspicion about whether rural electrification is, is really the way to drive development. I think there are other ways to think about driving development with, with energy, though. And I'd like to throw a couple examples out there. One is to think not about households, but to think about firms. So one way to help the 1.2 billion people who don't have electricity in their homes is to get them a job, not get them electricity in their house, but, but maybe power the local markets or the local factories with more reliable electricity so that they can expand and they can employ people. So for instance, I had a conversation with an entrepreneur in Lagos, Nigeria, where the electricity reliability is, is dismal. Um, there, there are constant outages. So he was trying to grow a firm. His firm had nothing to do with energy. He was developing beauty products, um, you know, makeup for the local market. But he was keenly aware of the problems with the electricity sector. He had a backup generator. His internet service provider had a backup generator. His accountant had a backup generator. So basically, in order to open a business in Lagos, you need to invest in a backup generator. But that's basically like paying a tax in order to open a, a business. And so that prevents him from growing as a business. It prevents other businesses from even starting. They re realize that they don't have enough to pay the tax to buy their, their generator. And so potentially, bringing higher quality power to firms rather than to households is a better way to drive, uh, to drive development. That relates to the, the issue that I already raised about the reliability of the electricity sector. And I think that there's been a lot of focus on households who don't have power because it's very easy to measure. We can quantify how many people live in a house without electricity. But reliability is something that's much harder to measure. And m most of the utilities that we're working with in, in the developing world don't know that there's an outage until somebody calls and says that there is an outage. And, and basically, in many parts of the world, even the developed world, that's true. If, if utilities aren't using smart meters, there's no report of an outage until somebody calls and, and tells them that there's an outage. And so I, I think this points to the need to collect better data so that we can really understand reliability, uh, to, to, collect, 
to collect information, not just to provide to the utility company, but also to provide to the regulator about the level of reliability. So I'm working with some engineers at UC Berkeley who have developed very low cost techniques for measuring electricity reliability. In some cases, they're using smartphones. And I think it's very ingenious, and so let me just describe it. They're, the app on the smartphone detects when the smartphone is charging. And then if the cell phone stops charging, it detects whether it's moving. And if it moves, that suggests that somebody unplugged the, the phone. But if it doesn't move, and it's also communicating this information to the cloud, and so if there are other phones nearby that stopped charging and did not move, the algorithm infers that there was an outage nearby. So you know, I think given the ubiquity of, of, of cell phones, as, as Antoine mentioned, this is potentially a, a really ingenious way to use the cellular network to collect information about electricity reliability. So I think that's just one example of, of the ways in which collecting better data, generating better information, sometimes using the telecommunications uh, network can help us make better decisions about the energy industry. So I'll leave it at that, but, but I welcome questions and I welcome thoughts on, on really how to drive development with the energy industry. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, <clears throat> Well, isn't it true that uh, in the 18th century we started providing energy to, to industries before putting it available for, uh, for households? So we keep, let us keep that for discussion. So, Stefan, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. So, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So, um, let me just, uh, to put this a little bit in context, say that uh, I, I happen to have spent a year um, since last August at the World Bank in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the World Bank is one of the main institutions that is involved in like uh, development, development policies and in particular uh, uh, in the field of energy and they're, they're very strong on, on trying to connect people. So that, of course, uh, is very related to the thing we've, we've heard before. And, and, and some of the thoughts I'm going to share with you actually uh, derive from, from the things I've learned this year, uh, talking to practitioners um, as well as, as researchers, applied researchers. So just to, to put a bit in, in context, so Catherine mentioned that there were like one billion people apparently, uh, approximately, that, that live without access to electricity. I mean, we live in dramatic times because in the last 30 or 40 years, poverty has declined uh, uh, in, 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 in very large amounts. And, and actually, we connected 2.3 billion people to electricity. But population is also growing, and there's still this billion people out there which lives without electricity. Most of them are in Africa. Uh, about 80% live in 20 countries. 16 of these countries are in Africa. Uh, and some countries are making progress and others are not. And, and we see different models, uh, which is interesting because then it gives us an opportunity to think about what might be the right models and the, or the wrong models to connect people uh, and, and give them access to, to energy. In addition, one, one aspect that, uh, that is very important is, is this aspect of quality, because of course um, you can have access to energy but at different levels. Uh, different levels of intensity of quality, etc. Uh, this is also true for water, but we tend to uh, forget that this is true for um, for energy as well. And and on top of that, you can have access to energy, but still be considered to be to be energy poor. So we know that even here in developed countries, there are people that have to uh, cut on heating during the winter. Uh, well, when you use uh, surveys from the developing countries. In some countries, you can estimate that people, among the people who have access to electricity, about 30% of them are actually energy poor in the sense that their demand is totally inelastic. So they're not able to uh, spend more if they want on, on energy. So why do we care, actually? Um, well, we care because we think that infrastructure in general, and energy in particular, uh, provides important services to households and firms. So direct services, and the, then there's this question whether it, it re actually really does provide direct benefits, um, which I'll, I'll come back at the end. Uh, but but there's also, uh, we also care because we think that this type of services have indirect benefits, uh, or what we call externalities. Uh, these externalities can be positive or negative. So to give you an example that is very important and, and discussed a lot in the field of energy, 
there's an estimation out there that about 4 million people die prematurely because of uh, the use of traditional biomass cooking. So this is wood and traditional biomass in the developing world, mostly women and children. Um, and this is caused by the emission of CO and um, uh, carbon monoxide and particulate ma matter. So uh, clean cooking actually uh, lags electrification. We have one billion people without electricity, three billion people lack access to clean cooking. So this is typically an externality uh, that uh, we think uh, is harmful and, and is a byproduct or a, a secondary benefit from electri uh, electrification. So, um, and, and, and this is hard to achieve because while we know that about a thousand dollars of per capita GDP countries start to uh, catch up in terms of electrification, they don't catch up in terms of, of clean cooking, for example. This is at a much higher level, uh, probably around 12,000. Okay, so this is, this is just one of the, on the challenge that we have in, in front of us. Um, so the second point that I want to make, and, and this is, comes very much from my, my experience at the, at the World Bank, is, uh, I mean, we know that people probably uh, need to be elec uh, connected to electricity. Uh, this is actually a part of the sustainable development goals. Um, but we don't really know uh, how much we should invest or how much should be invested. We, act we actually don't even know how much is being invested currently on a global scale. And this is very striking because uh, you probably all hear about these big numbers that uh, Pricewaterhouse or, or McKinsey put out there that this $1.5 trillion that should be invested in infrastructure. But actually, when you dig in into how these numbers are produced, um, I mean, most of these numbers have no real basis in research. And we don't actually know exactly even how much is, is, uh, is being invested. So most of the time, we base our estimates on national budgets or on national accounts. Um, all methods have problems. Um, sometimes we complement this using data from PPP database, like public-private partnerships, which give us some hint on private investments, uh, quite imperfect as well. And just to, so I, I've tried to dig some numbers on, on how much is invested based on what we know and, and which is very imperfect. And, and currently we're about 2.5% of GDP in, in Asia and Pacific, and that's only for energy. Uh, driven mostly by China, who has very high rates of investment. Uh, we only had 0.75 or 1% in Latin America and the Caribbean, and probably 0.3% in Africa. That's very low. The estimation that we have, again based on these bad numbers, is that, well, the, the level in Asia is probably fine. Uh, in, in Latin America, we should multiply this by 2, and in Africa, we might want to multiply this by 10 or 15 if we want to uh, be able to reach uh, adequate level of investment. So um, another side of this is that, of course, and this is related to the climate issue, uh, doing so will add to the global energy demand. And, and we know now, and partly thanks to the, the work of Catherine and his co-authors, that, uh, co that uh, as we electrify and as we connect people to the energy grid, people also start uh, accessing appliances, and so their consumption increases much more uh, than what we initially thought. So um, there is hardly energy leapfrogging. There's some work by Arthur van Bentham that shows that, in fact, um, the energy intensity of countries that are electrifying currently is as high as it was in developed countries in the past. Uh, for different reasons, one is industrial outsourcing and the other one is that people move to more intensive bundles of consumption. So uh, probably uh, as we uh, connect these billion people that is still unconnected, um, the energy demand will uh, increase uh, by a, a very large amount. So one, one issue and then that connects I think to, uh, to Antoine uh, uh, discussion earlier, uh, is uh, how do we connect these people. So there are some estimates out there that say 30% uh, should be access to grid extension. I think we're talking about Africa here. About 50% should mini grids and the rest might be like standalone systems, like solar, uh, solar home systems. Uh, this has very different implications because on-grid, uh, gener generation for on-grid tends to be mostly fossil fuel and nuclear energy while generation for mini-grids is mostly renewable. So the design of the political economy and the regulation of this thing uh, will, be, will be very different. 
so let me move to the last the last point I want to make, which is about uh, financing. So so one one discussion that is currently ongoing uh, is actually has been around for a long time, but is being framed right now in the world bank is this discussion about the financing cascade. So so the thinking is the following: people say there are a lot of there's a lot of private money available for to finance infrastructure. So whenever it's possible. Uh, we should avoid using scarce public and concessional funds, and we should try to bring in uh, private investment without public guarantee. That we have very complex regulatory and, and financial issues that, are, that, uh, that we need to solve and address, and in particular for researchers, this is very good news. The World Bank has conducted a very interesting study on what was called the Washington Consensus. So like 25 years ago, uh, people were, were saying, oh, we need to, to do four things. We basically need to create an independent regulator. We need to unbundle um, vertically and horizontally if possible. We, we need to liberalize and we need to privatize. And they, they've done something very simple. They've just done a, a review of which countries did that and which country did it. And the answer is, is, uh, is a bit troubling because in fact what happens is that many countries haven't done that. Many countries, and especially developing and emerging, co emerging countries, have done part of it, not necessarily in the right order. So it seems like uh, this, this whole uh, challenge of regulation that we had at the time had answers that have not been followed for many reasons, uh, some of them probably political. Uh, and, and nowadays we face different issues because the, the objective has changed. We're not only looking at efficiency, but we want uh, to connect everybody. Uh, uh, we want to address climate change, uh, we have technological change, uh, and so there's a new regulatory challenge out there. And my last one would be, I'm, I'm strongly convinced that we cannot address energy issues in isolation, and that I agree a lot with, with Catherine, that we need to think about the complementarity between services, energy, water, transport. Uh, they're related for direct and indirect reasons, and they're, they're, that, that only in this way can we uh, really understand the challenge of energy quality and infrastructure in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so so let me, before, before starting the discussion with the floor, let me, let me uh, raise a few uh, questions related to, the, to this presentation. Um, uh, Catherine, I'm surprised by this question. I did read your paper, and, uh, but I'm a, a big fan of uh, Robert Dorman's books on you know, uh, how, how the last two centuries and what kind of innovation were the most useful for the people yeah. in the Western world. And, and, and one of these when water, sanitation are important, as electrification seems to, when you, when you read that book, I mean, you see what is uh, at the, at, uh, between the 18th, 19th century and the 20th century, electrification clear in the omnivore. In the Western world. So, so the fact that you get to discover that uh, electrification in the rural areas does not generate a lot of uh, welfare improvement, it's, 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 it's quite shocking. And so, so maybe, uh, uh, well, that seems to be contradiction with the position of, of Antoine and, and Stefan, so maybe you want to have a reaction to that. Oh, uh, yeah, a couple, a couple reactions. So for one thing, when the U.S., for instance, did the Rural Electrification Act and when we started electrifying, the income per capita was about six times as high as it is currently in Kenya. So it could be that in order to take advantage of electricity, you just need to be at a higher income level. And in fact, in our study, we're seeing that people who were connecting just aren't using much electricity. They, they don't have... On average, they have you know, a light bulb and maybe a TV. Fewer than half of the households who we connected have a TV. But if you introduce financing for appliances and, and lower the upfront purchase cost and, and let people pay for the appliance over time, maybe that will overcome the credit constraint to, to add in the appliance. I also think I should emphasize that our results are after people had been connected for 18 to 24 months. And so it's possible that it just takes longer, that, that electrification will lead to these you know, structural changes in the way the economies operate, but it, it takes longer than, than we let the, the experiment run. It continues to run, so we will go back and, and survey the households and see if things have changed after four or five years. I guess I'll, I will make one other, but I think there are potentially 
other development initiatives that do have impacts in the short run. And so it gets back to this question of what you want to do first. Um, so for instance, in the area where we're working in Western Kenya, there's an NGO that gives cash to people. And it, it, it ends up that it's about the same amount of cash as the cost of giving them an electricity connection is. And they see big effects. After uh, 18 to 24 months. So yeah, I, I think we do need to let it run earlier or re let it run longer, but yeah, I think there are other development initiatives that take effect long. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, maybe for Antoine and Stéphane, because they, you, you talk a little bit about that. Uh, I mean, obviously, in developing countries, one of the big questions is concerned the, the expropriation of the investment. So you, you make the investment, and then the state comes and, and take over for free uh, what you did. And, and I also, I mentioned Robert Gordon. I'm also a big fan of Darona Semoglu book, book on, on, on in, uh, you know, uh, legal aspects of property right in order to organize uh, development. So, 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 w do you think this kind of problem of ex the risk of ex expropriation is a big challenge for the problem of developing uh, renewable energy in, in in the developing world? And, and, and if yes, what what should we do uh, to to be uh, able to solve the problem? So, I mean, this this used to be and is still a problem for concessions of infrastructure. So, as you know, my uh, I started my career <laughs> with Jean-Jacques Lafont uh, working on renegotiation of concession uh, in Latin America, and then we found that like uh, seventy percent of them were renegotiated in like three years, and and it's still a problem. And it's exactly one of the reasons why I'm saying that I don't believe private funds are going to overflow this market. Now, I mean, I don't think like renewable projects are concessions really or are structured as PPPs, but the, the equivalent of that would be the regulatory risk. Because if you buy, if you build a mini grid, you need some, some security or some, some guarantee on how it will later be connected to the grid if that happens to be the case, what would be the interconnection charges and and if there is a lot of uncertainty on that, I mean, this is kind of a, in a similar way to actually expropriate returns, uh, even if you don't expropriate per se the, 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 the investors. So, so, I mean, this is a very relevant question. And, and of course, the question of commitment for governments in, in many of these countries is a, is a huge one. But so. Antoine, do we know the duration of the commitment on the uh, price of elect uh, electricity for your Morocco uh, project? I mean, the, well, this eight, 28 uh, yes, euros per ton of CO2, it's for, uh, for per ton uh, per megawatt hour, sorry. Uh, for what duration? Do you yes, get the usually those kind of contracts are worth uh, 20, 25 years long. So indeed, th th there is a, a risk linked to this uh, expropriation uh, issue. Um, but, uh, well, according to the different countries we are active in, uh, we, are, we, are, we are confident that uh, many countries uh, will stick to their signature. This is often a, a case that, uh, an issue that we take into account in the investment funds that we have at NG. And uh, we al always have this kind of, of, of questions and issues to, to tackle. To what extent can we be confident uh, with the, the country's signature when we have such a long-term PPA? Of course, it depends also on whether these PPA are signed with countries or, or local firms. I mean, uh, it could be, for instance, a, a mining industry with which we have a, a long-term PPA. And then, of course, uh, the, the, the challenge uh, is, is a bit different because the, the, credit, is, the credit issue is, is different. But this is, for the time being, we, we find it manageable. So very related to the issue of expropriation is the issue of, of leakage, and we've seen evidence of, of leakage. So I agree completely that the institutions are very important here, and I, I don't know how to solve some of these institutional questions. But just as an example, we were working with the Rural Electrification Authority in Kenya, and the person in charge of assigning contracts at the Rural Electrification Authority also ran a contracting business. And so w one thing we did is we, we collected information on what the contractor's invoices said. So for instance, the contractor's invoices said, we put up 100 poles in a given village. And then we went out and counted, and there were not 100 poles, especially for the, the self-dealing, for the, the guy who was giving his own firm the business. We, we saw that there were, on average, 60 poles if he said there were 100. Thank you very much. 
uh, one last question before I, uh, I ask the floor to react. I mean, one, ten one source of tension between, in particular, Catherine and Antoine it seems to be, I mean, you, you, you Catherine, uh, stress the fact that uh, in, uh, intermittency, I mean, uh, reliability of the supply of electricity is important in order to uh, electricity to have an, eff an effect on, on behavior and on welfare. And Antoine, you, you uh, were very uh, convincing in the idea of we sh what we should do, after all, is to develop renewable energy. But we know the problem of renewable energy is the intermittency, you know, the fact that you are not sure the electricity will be there when you need it. So, so and in the absence of uh, cheap source of, uh, of uh, storage of electricity, what kind of uh, what kind of solution, uh, given the importance of the of the reliability of the system? Yeah. Th thank you, Christian, for this question. For sure, reliability is a, is a key issue to be tackled in, in, a, in any country, I would say, for sure. And um, here we have different solutions to, um, uh, to, to ensure reliability on the grids and at home and uh, in the, at firm. Um, in, in, countries, in Western countries, because we have a, a global system relying on many different sources, we, we need to have the most flexible and the most economic one to, um, uh, to um, supply electricity when there is no wind or no, no solar. And in, in Western countries, we usually rely on uh, gas units which are uh, flexible, which can start in a few minutes and which can then deliver uh, power to the grid the most effective and uh, quick way. Uh, and we do believe that uh, gas uh, will uh, be part of, of the future in the long run uh, due to the quality of gas to, to produce power. Now, when it comes to emerging countries, the question could be, okay, should we also invest in such uh, combined cycle turbines uh, with gas? Should we have other uh, means to ensure reliability? And here I think that th there is no obvious answer about it. It will ob obviously depend on the topography of, of, uh, of, the, of a given country, um, the quality of the grid, the capability of the grid or the grids uh, to, uh, supl to, be, to supply reliable uh, power. And in, in, in the future, what we could see, especially uh, in some uh, isolated uh, countries or islands, is that uh, some energy storage uh, will be part of the answer. Of course, it will take time before these energy storage solutions are fully competitive, but like for uh, solar power, we, we do expect uh, energy storage solutions to be cheaper and cheaper in, in the future. And we already work on some uh, business models in, uh, in Asia Pacific, for instance, where by combining uh, renewables plus energy storage, we uh, could be uh, in a position to provide reliable um, power. And coming back not to our emerging countries, but a country in the, uh, in the Gulf region, um, there are some tenders where uh, the country uh, wants solar power, but not from PV, but from CSP. And here then you have uh, an embedded solution to uh, store energy and then to provide, en uh, to provide electricity at uh, night house. It's becoming more and more competitive and it will fly in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, thank you. So let me, let me ask you, do you have questions? So you have the possibility to uh, raise it in French or in English. In Dutch would be a little bit more complicated for me. Um, my, my, I speak it yourself? in English. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. Uh, so I'm Dominique Pialo. I'm a French journalist. I would. It's a question for actually all of you. Uh, so you you think it would be more efficient to provide uh, farms and factories, for example, with electricity than households? And my question for NG is: Would that be possible for you? Would Would you say, uh, Catherine, that uh, uh, all the big companies running to Africa 
uh, with the will to electrify the rural villages um, don't really care about whether this is efficient or not and just want to sell their solutions. And for you, would, would that be possible for you to make a business out of more uh, a solution like the one you suggested and not uh, electrifying households directly? Does my question make sense? Do you understand what I mean? I mean, is there still a business case for you to go and, and um, maybe um, help people to create more jobs before uh, give them access to electricity in the house? Thank you. So let, let me <laughs> take a, a set of questions before, uh, before we ask the panelists to react. Yes? Yes, uh, François Lévesque from MIM Paritech. Uh, I wonder whether there is a mismatch between uh, the willingness uh, to give money to uh, projects uh, by citizens and by public uh, institutions, uh, meaning that uh, electrification uh, seems very uh, exciting and, and a very good idea. And on the other hand, some, uh, as you told uh, us, uh, um, Catherine, it's very imp the, e the key issue, the key question is, uh, if we have one dollar, when we have to uh, put it, uh, what is the best way to, uh, to put this money for energy? So it's, so how to correct this uh, mismatch, or is this mismatch uh, a problem? And if it is an issue, how to try to correct this mismatch between the willingness to pay for sexy things or attractive things and uh, uh, what uh, is really needed? Thank you. Let me take one last question before uh, asking my colleagues to react. Also, oh, maybe. Yeah, let me. Let me. Uh, I, there will be another wave. Uh, so prepare your question. So, so Catherine, maybe you should react to the second question in front for the first. Sh sure. Um, uh, this is a response to both questions. I think there is. And also a non-economic argument for connecting people. There's a, a moral argument that you know everyone deserves to be part of the modern economy. Uh, there's a political argument, clearly. It, it's become very political in Kenya to announce the number of new connections. Although, you know, as an economist, I, I would push back a little bit on the, the moral argument as different from the development argument. I, th I think it's important to to realize that resources are limited and if we give people an electricity connection we're spending money that we could have been using to, to give them something else. Um, yeah, I guess I'll also say that as an economist we looked at lots of economic indicators of electrification. So we looked at the number of assets that the household earn, um, owned, that their income levels. The one thing that we found was impacted by electrification was non-economic, and we just asked people, "How happy are you?" And they, it was a, it was a small effect. It's not huge, but it was statistically significant that people with electricity were happier. And so, it, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do that about that. They're happier even though their economic situation isn't better. But anecdotally, we heard that people felt secure, they felt safer if they had lighting outside, for instance. Um, I also, on this question of whether energy can make money without doing rural connections, uh, supplying the firms, I would say y that yes, that maybe even they would make more money, that because the rural electrification has led to, uh, in Kenya, they're seeing a, a severe decline in the average residential consumption now that they're connecting uh, the, the poor rural households. So Kenya actually has a, a reserve a margin of 40%. They have way more generation than, than they need. And so connecting rural households is not solving that problem. Uh, whereas I think connecting firms, which tend to be heavier, bigger uses, that, that opens up markets for, for energy. Yeah, maybe a, a few additional words uh, in addition to what you said, Catherine, and I fully agree with you. Uh, you know, as, um, as a company like NG, we, we, we make the difference between what is charity and what is business. Uh, we do support some charity actions uh, thanks to some vehicles like uh, Rassembleur d'Energie, uh, which is supported by our foundation. 
But when it comes to business, we, we, we want to find the appropriate business models in order to, of course, deliver what is useful and expected by our uh, customers, but also uh, trying to make money out of it, because then we, we wouldn't uh, be able to run the company in, in, in the long run. Uh, and for instance, we, we are active th thanks to Rassembleur d'Energie in many, uh, in some countries in, in Africa, while in parallel, uh, we, we, we launched um, some years ago uh, via uh, an internal startup uh, um, a, a new uh, business model which, is, which also exists in other uh, companies uh, to develop a microgrid at not, even not at a village level but really at a, uh, at a district level within a village or within a city in order to enable people uh, to have access to the grid, to this microgrid, and to have some electricity supply. And, and of course, uh, putting in place such a business model takes time because there is everything to be put in place uh, from the supply chain until the installation and the maintenance in, in the district uh, to ensure that uh, power can be delivered to, uh, to, to the local people. Back to your, to your first point, through to your question, should we invest directly in electricity supply or uh, should we first uh, uh, foster economic development and job creation? We will mainly focus on, on the first one. If uh, inst institutions can foster the second aspect, it could be good in order to uh, supply electricity to, to the people. Uh, yeah, I, can, I can just say a word on... On your question whether we, we can like invest in projects that uh, even if, even though people don't want or can't pay, of course we do. I mean, we do that for rural roads. We do that for many other things. We do that for uh, sanitation. And, you know, we fully know that people are not able to pay the full fees that would cover the cost, and especially not the long-term cost of, of, of these services. Uh, where it becomes difficult is uh, doing that and involving the private sector because, as he says, I mean, the private sector has to see some return at some point. And that's where we see all these problems with these PPPs that are where based on availability payments and, and things like that. And, and there's no real market test there. So that, that's, a, that's a real issue. And on, on where we should invest first, I mean, um, I was shocked this year to learn that the World Bank doesn't have a methodology to uh, estimate the return from an education project. So if we don't know the return from an education project, how can we decide whether we want to invest one dollar in education versus electricity? We, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, it's a huge issue. Maybe we. Even the World Bank, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I mean, you suppose that if this methodology was around, they, they probably would, would know about it, right? Okay. Well, there is a lot of work to be done yet for economists. Uh, but we are here. Um, let, me, let, me, um, let me go back to one of the uh, interesting points raised by Antoine during your presentation. You seem to suggest that even without the price of carbon, this the development uh, of these renewable energies in the developing world is, is profitable uh, in one way or another. Um, and, and that the renewable energy is competitive compared to oil uh, and other sources. So, uh, uh, I, have been, uh, I have been asking that kind of question for the last two years. It seems that more and more people seem to be convinced about that, but I don't have real numbers about that. So I'm, I'm happy to get these numbers of these 28 uh, euros yeah. per uh, megawatt hour for Mar Morocco. Uh, but but, but what's, uh, how far can we go in that direction without the price of carbon? Well, here, uh, Christian, you're raising two different points which can be linked to some, to some extent. Uh, I will try to answer first your question related to this decrease in, price, in, uh, in prices levels. Um, what, we see, um, what we've seen those last years is a huge decrease in, um, in, in, in prices for power production from solar and wind. Uh, just a few figures. As regards uh, production from solar, Prices have been divided, uh, cost, excuse me, cost have been divided by 10 in 10 years, okay? Thanks to uh, technological um, uh, improvements. And also thanks to the supply chain improvements. I think we need to keep in mind that this is also possible today thanks to a very efficient supply chain from PV production 
uh, until uh, installation in, in the countries. Another example I'd like to share with you is about wind. I mentioned offshore wind, and we were struck a few weeks ago uh, to learn that um, in, in um, I think it was in Germany, uh, the, uh, some companies managed to win bids for, uh, to, for, for, for offshore wind without putting any um, let's say um, requested subsidy uh, for their future uh, wind farms, meaning that they consider taking into account the cost uh, decrease to come uh, to supply uh, the um, uh, to supply all the the, the the components of wind farms and taking into account maybe also an increase in world sale prices in Europe they consider that they don't need any subsidy uh, to uh, launch those uh, wind farms in, in the North Sea. It means that those competitors consider that uh, offshore wind will be competitive at some point in time with other means of production. Now, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the link with the CO2 price, of course, the higher the CO2 price is, the, the more competitive the other solutions are. Uh, the question is, um, well, at which uh, pace uh, and at which level should we have uh, this um, CO2 price so has to definitely give the right uh, signal prices to investors uh, so that they make uh, the most, uh, let's say, CO2 light investments in, in the future. And there are many okay, reports, uh, studies and reports about uh, this, uh, this challenge. I have mentioned a range. Uh, what we like today is uh, maybe not uh, a global, a worldwide uh, CO2 price because that may be uh, very ambitious, but at least a regional price uh, for Europe so that in Europe or in other, regional, uh, um, in other regions, uh, we have a, a consistent uh, CO2 price to foster uh, energy transition and to make it sure that investments go where uh, it is the best. And so the price should be 30 euros per ton of CO2? Or what, what, what well, would be we the, can have different, you know, um, depending on the, uh, the studies and the economics you make, uh, there are different ranges. We consider that between 30 and 50 uh, by uh, 2020, which is very close by, and around, yeah, we have in mind 100, and 100 for 2030, but those are more, let's say, guidelines that uh, accurate or precise figures. But that will not arise soon in Africa. Uh, no. So um, what, what's the alternative? Uh, African countries, I don't think African countries, even, even if the US is unable to do that, uh, how, how can Africa... Uh, given all the other challenges faced by, the, by those countries, uh, seriously taking uh, actions against climate change uh, by putting a price at that level. Uh, remember, in Europe, the price of carbon is only five euros yeah, per ton of CO2. But the, the question could be for, uh, I will let my colleagues react on that, uh, but the question could be uh, does Africa uh, need a CO2 price? today. Um, because wh why am I asking such a question? Because in, in some countries, power is produced from oil, which, which is very uncompetitive compared to uh, other means of production. So uh, where uh, power production is very, very inefficient, uh, the same for some islands and so on, where uh, power is produced from oil, in fact, um, due to lack, lack of competitiveness, um, power production from oil will, will sooner or later disappear because it will become uncompetitive. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me, let me, oh, okay, Catherine, go ahead. Uh, just, just to interject, I think people in this room probably understand this, but I have colleagues who get frustrated when people quote levelized cost of energy numbers for renewables and something like $28 per megawatt hour and compare that to a natural gas plant because it's a different product with, with 
solar and wind, it's, it's intermittent. And with a CCGT, you can completely control when you're getting the megawatt hours. So in California, for instance, we are running an experiment and trying to inform the rest of the world about how to operate a system with, with more and more renewables. And this spring, we've had uh, 20 days where the price in the wholesale market has been consistently negative in the middle of the day, where we've basically had too much solar production. We, we have a really rainy spring, so we had a lot of hydro production, and we've been curtailing the, the solar. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I think we're, we're pushing up against the limits where we, we definitely need storage. We need yeah. cheap bulk storage. No, I fully agree. But uh, to avoid any misunderstanding, that's why I mentioned bids and not LCOE. Oh, okay. I'm talking about commercial bids and not LCOE because we do make the difference indeed. Uh, did we cover everything or do you have uh, some question? So I have one question, Antoine. Uh, don't you, s uh, in fact, uh, all of you, uh, don't you think that if, if really, as you said, uh, oil should stay uh, uh, underground, uh, at the end, um, I mean, those oil-rich uh, countries will react by flooding the market before it's too late, before those technologies really take over everything. And uh, so, so uh, don't you expect a reaction by oil-rich oil country before it's too late? I will start and then I will uh, give the mic to my colleagues. Um, you know, when we talk about energy transition, uh, what is Im the two words are important, energy and transition. And transition could last decades. It will not happen overnight. And I, I, I do expect those countries to um, take that into account. When we see what's going on in countries like Saudi Arabia, where they have plans, okay, they have recently adapted them to to be more realistic, but they do have plans to adapt their own uh, production system to be more and more renewables, to move away from their, uh, let's say, uh, inefficient uh, CO2 emitting systems. So internally, uh, they, they do uh, take into account the current changes uh, to adapt their own systems. And of course, that, that, that's a point, which is, which is that's a really a question ahead of us how uh, the economic situation uh, will um, be modified in the decades to come when uh, less and less oil is consumed by the other countries. I don't have the answer, obviously, but for sure they have that in mind. I, at least I expect they have that in mind. Okay. So uh, let, let me go for a try of uh, conclusion. Uh, so my, my conclusion from this is that it seems we should be quite optimistic. Uh, and uh, given, given the evolution of the price, uh, the cost of producing renewable energy, uh, there are uh, things uh, that we couldn't expect uh, to emerge uh, soon that will emerge uh, quite uh, fast, in particular given that even we have business people here uh, ready, to, ready to do something, and Roland already did something, in fact. Uh, so, so that's quite fascinating. Uh, however, um, I think there are still many constraints, in particular uh, the, 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 many, the, the many problems related to property rights, uh, regulations, uh, institutional aspects that uh, seems to matter a lot, uh, we, 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 still, we still have to work on that. Um, thank you very much. So let me conclude this, uh, this uh, session. So we, there is, a, there is a, a break, a co a coffee break right now for 30 minutes. So we reconvene here in uh, uh, a few minutes before four o'clock. Thank you very much. And thank you for the panel. <laughs>